Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we doing today? Baruch Hashem, right? Thank God. Today we're going to be talking about something you've seen me wear, something you see um, Jewish men all over wear, and something that is uh, very I don't know, important, maybe that's not the right word, something which is almost um, good evening, Henny. Something which is like synonymous with, synonymous with Judaism. If you talk about the culture, or you see a person and you wanted to describe a Jewish person, the first thing that will come to mind is he was wearing a kippah. So tonight's question of why, based on the response I got from someone, why do we wear a kippah? I want to talk not only about why we wear a kippah, but also I'm going to, I, I promise that although the beginning of what I'll say tonight, some of you may be aware and you may know why we wear a kippah and what it symbolizes. There is something beautiful I will share with you in a few minutes, something I'm sure that I can't say nobody knows, but a, a beautiful psychological and spiritual perspective to the wearing of a kippah that's truly beautiful. I hope you will stay tuned for a few minutes so we can get there. We'll start from the beginning. We'll talk about the source of the kippah. We'll talk about why we wear it all day, not just during prayer. We'll just share a beautiful story about the power of a kippah. Then I will share with you something very meaningful about the kippah. And then, of course, why women don't wear a kippah, because that's always a question. So, L'chaim, ladies and gentlemen, on my uh, Pellegrino. Good evening, Randy. It is so good to see you online watching us. Um, glad to see everyone that's watching on Lifelong Jewish Learning. I see we have a comment here on the chat. Good evening, Gail. I hope that your son is doing better. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Many people think that it's a mitzvah to wear a kippah. And of course, they're not uh, wrong for thinking that, not wrong, they're not, they're not to be blamed for thinking that because wearing a kippah is something you see all religious people doing all the time. Um, and you walk into any shul in the world, um, at least at this point in time, I think, I hope, you walk into any shul in the world, no matter denomination, no matter, again, I hope, I'm not 100% sure, but no matter denomination or country or culture, uh, they'll have a box of kippahs in the front and they'll tell you to put on the kippah and they, you know, out of, even if you don't normally wear a kippah, you wear a kippah in the synagogue. So let's start from the beginning. Wearing a kippah is not a biblical mitzvah in any way. It is not one of the 613 commandments. There is no verse in the Torah that says, thou shalt wear a kippah, not even a hint of a verse. And in fact, for the beginning of Jewish history, the majority of Jewish men did not wear a kippah. Who did wear a kippah? not a kippah, but a head covering, was the Kohanim, the priests. No one ever, and all the priests that served in the temple, they had four garments that they had to wear, their tunic, the belt, the trousers, and a, a, um, a head covering. It wasn't the kippah we have today, it was more of a turban style uh, belt that was wrapped around, but they wore a covering over their head whenever they were in the temple, whenever they were involved in doing the holy service. It became accepted that no Jew would walk into the temple, into the Beit HaMikdash or the Mishkan, with his head uncovered. Now you have to realize that in olden times, wearing your head covering was a sign of respect. Um, even until probably half a century ago, people, men didn't leave their home without putting on a hat and covering their head. It was a certain sign of getting dressed and being respectful. You didn't walk around bareheaded. You walked around your head covered. And so it became an accepted thing that a person would never enter the temple with his head uncovered. In addition, whenever a person wanted to pray, they would wear a kippah. In addition, the greater leaders of the Jewish people, the rabbis and members of the courts and hedron, they began to wear a kippah or a head covering as a sign of respect and a sign of status, perhaps maybe of their spiritual status, not only when they wanted to pray, and not only when they were entering a holy place, but they would wear their head covering the entire day. And from there became an established custom that became accepted by all of Israel to always wear a kippah. 
And this idea is mentioned in the Talmud. It's written explicitly in the Talmud. It's not a recent idea. And I don't want to spend too long on this part because this is not the interesting part. But in general, it is interesting, but it's just not about Kippur per se. In Judaism, there is a very strong power to the things that are done as a result of people doing them. Meaning, in the Torah, Judaism, I should say, is not only about God superimposing his will upon us and God telling us how we should live our lives. There are many aspects of Judaism today that are directly a result of us on our own elevating ourselves, uplifting ourselves, and adding to the level of observance, and adding to the level of commitment and relationship with God. Many, many examples, whether it's the second day of the Chag, whether it's uh, even the Bar Mitzvah to a certain extent, many things that today are, are, are uh, you know, basic parts of Judaism that are not explicitly in the Torah or not in the Torah at all, that became the Jewish way of doing things and became an accepted norm. And this is the way Judaism continues. The, the halacha is the way Jewish law is set up that a, excuse me, a lower court cannot change from a higher court once something is recorded in the Talmud, it becomes all the, bar, the Talmud was accepted by all the Jews at that time. All the rabbis signed on it and they accepted this would be the final unchangeable law. And so this is now the law. It's become a requirement on any Jewish man to wear a keep. In fact, it says that a person shouldn't walk with more than four feet without a keep over his head because the Shechina, the divine presence, is resting upon us. And if you have the Shechina, the divine presence resting upon you, you need to make sure that you have the kippah over your head as a sign of respect to the shekin. And so today, when we wear a kippah, what it represents is this idea that God is over me and I have a respect and an appreciation and a recognition that God is over me. And so therefore, as a sign of respect and uh, appreciation for God, we wear the kippah. In fact, the Hebrew word kippah, kippah just means a covering. But the word that's more often used is a yamuka. I'm sure you've heard that word. Yamuka is not actually a Yiddish word. It's actually from an Aramaic word. The word yamuka is called yare malka. Two, two Aramaic words. Yare means fear, malka of the king. So we wear the kippah to have yare malka, to have fear of the king over us. In Yiddish, it's called a couple or a kepala. I've heard that people say, uh, you put on your kepala, your kepala. A couple is, because cup in Yiddish means head. So a kepala or a kepala is a Yiddish expression for the yamuka in Aramaic or the kippah in Hebrew. They all mean a sign of respect that God is above me, God is over me. And just like we would never go to pray without putting on a are covering our head is a sign of respect. So too, uh, since God is always with us, it's not like God is only with us and present and watching us when we pray, but God is always present. And wherever we go, God goes with us. Famous verse, Mala ha'are, that, that, that the glory of God, the glory of God fills the entire universe. God is everywhere. God is in everything. So because we are always in the presence of God, wherever we go, we wear a kippah. However, I should point something out. Because wearing a kippah is not a biblical commandment, not a mitzvah, therefore we don't make a blessing on putting on the kippah. Before you put on the talis, before you put on tzolim, before you do a mitzvah, you make a blessing. Before you light candles, you make a blessing. There is no blessing for the kippah because it's not a mitzvah. In addition, because it's not a mitzvah, the kippah is not inherently holy. Although I see many people, if the kippah falls on the floor, they pick it up and they kiss it. The kippah does not need to be buried if it's old and torn. Very often people come to the shul, they're old kippahs, they don't want to throw it out. So they bring their old kippahs to the shul. And sometimes it's good, I, I put them out on the table in the front so that we have extra kippahs because very often people put them on and walk away with them. So we got our own nice, now we have to come to shul, beautiful, um, monogrammed kippahs. It's already getting a little old and worn out. They were beautiful kippahs. Our logo and our Chabad uh, Jewish center on them. But um, 
they don't have to bring him to the synagogue. A kippah could be thrown into the garbage, it could be whatever else. The kippah you're, has no, in the head, you're allowed to go to the bathroom with it. A kippah has no holiness per se, because it's not a holy object, it's not used for a mitzvah. So, why do women not wear a kippah? Women don't wear a kippah because women don't need a constant reminder like men do that something above them. By the way, the very idea of the kippah is that there's something above me. There is something that reminds me of the king. A woman does not need an actual physical, tangible reminder of the fact that she finds herself in the presence of God. Women are inherently more spiritually connected and more spiritually sensitive than men. That's why women are always the ones that are more involved and more eager and more eager to learn. I am sure that, uh, I don't know who's watching tonight, but I'm sure more women than men are watching. And in general, more women love to learn Torah. And women are naturally more spiritually connected, which is why they don't need the superimposed reminders and um, the jolt and the super, uh, the, the, the uh, wake-up calls that men do. And therefore, women don't need to wear a physical covering over their head because women naturally are able to just connect and be reminded of the fact that they are living under the watchful eye of God. Women naturally have more of a humble, sensitive spirit that allows them to be more subservient to the spirit of God, to give themselves over to serving God and to serving others, to, to take care, to nurture others, as opposed to being self-absorbed the way men naturally are. They know I'm about to become like a sexist and racist and bigoted. But women were created by God with a much more giving nature because they are by, 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 by divine design. Women are more, less self-aware and more connected both to God and to others. They're, they're connected, by the way. And therefore, women don't need a physical reminder of the fact that God is watching because they naturally have that feeling on their Now, I'm going to share much of what I said you may have already known. I'm now going to share with you a story in the Talmud that's very interesting about the power of a kippah. And again, the best is still to come. The Talmud, I think it's in Brachas, if I remember correctly, the Talmud tells a story it's actually not a story about the it's a story about the power of astrologers. And the, the Talmud brings, I believe, four stories about astrologers, stargazers, that had predicted certain things about Jewish people that did not come true. For whatever reason, each one a different mitzvah, different reason. One of the stories, I did look it up, and I'm going from memory. One of the stories in the Talmud, I'm not going to say the name because I don't remember again. I didn't look it up before. I, I, I'm going to remember. I, know the, I, I remember learning the Talmud. One of the stories is with a mother, an expecting mother, who is told by the stargazers that her son would grow up to be a thief, a robber. And um, she was obviously very worried about this. And I don't remember if she, she spoke to Rabbi or she on her own decided that she would always have to... Um, That's a good question. We'll get there. So she decided that she would always make sure that, I think one of the rabbis told her to make sure that her son's head was always covered. And so she made a commitment that the son that was born to her always wore a kippah. From a very, very young age, he always wore a kippah. And in fact, he grew up to be a great rabbi, a great sage who had no tendency to steal. One day the Talmud says, this rabbi, again, I don't want to say his name, I don't remember. I didn't have a chance to look it up before the class. I'm going... Up the, I mean, I did look a little bit today. But um, so this rabbi was one day sitting under a palm tree. And all of a sudden, I don't know, a wind blew. And his yarmulke, his keeper fell off his head. And all of a sudden, this tremendous urge came over him to eat the dates of this palm tree. It wasn't his palm tree. It was a privately owned palm tree. And this tremendous urge came over him to climb up the tree and to steal the dates of the tree to eat them. And then quickly put his keeper back on his head. And when he put the keeper back on his head, the urge went away. And from here, the Talmud tells us the power of the keeper. That a person wears a keeper, it can remind him of the presence of God, which in turn keeps him from the temptation and the distractions and the 
the, uh, the, the, the evil um, cunning of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination that tries to lead us astray. Now, someone asked a very good question on Facebook. So, do women, according to the Talmud, have a different neshama to men? Uh, this, again, we're getting into very dangerous territory. It's a dangerous time nowadays. But I'm not afraid to speak truth. To speak Torah is not my opinion, so it's not if you politically correct or not. The answer is that men and women are two parts of a neshama. The idea of a bashert, when you find your bashert and you find your uh, your soulmate, called a bashert in Yiddish, in Hebrew it's called a zivug, your pair, your match, you are finding the other half of your soul. If you remember the story of creation, Adam was not, in the beginning of creation, there was one human, one person called Adam, and then Eve, or a woman, was taken from men. And so therefore, man being the soul of Adam and the Chava were originally one, it was separated. And also, if you study the gates of reincarnation, as we did Shabbos mornings for quite a while, all souls originally begin in Adam. So Adam and Eve are the two halves of the soul, and that's why marriage has to be between a Jewish man and a Jewish woman, because only... The only way that you can have the other half of your soul is if you're marrying someone that could be the other half of your soul. For a man to marry another man, or for to marry a non-Jewish woman, etc., that could not be the other half of their soul. It could not be their basha. No matter how wonderful, or beautiful, or amazing, they may enjoy the other person's company, etc. Hope oh, that answers your question. Okay, I'm going to show you one more story, and then I'm going to give you a beautiful perspective. There were two very famous brothers called the, um, the Shapiro brothers. I'm trying to remember the first name. Now I actually just, just see the story before class, but I don't remember the first names of hand. But they were famous brothers. They were printers. They were the printers of the famous Slavita Press, print house. Many, many of the Svarim, the books we have today, uh, come from this printing house of the two brothers of Slavita. They were very righteous people. They literally risked their lives and did much to ensure that Judaism will be uh, printed, Torah to be printed, and this way to be kept and not to be lost and to be able to be spread to the world. And many of the Jewish books we have are to their credit. So these brothers were eventually arrested by the Tsarist Russia in the 1800s on whatever trumped up charges. There was, I believe, a blood libel, if I remember correctly. If you're familiar with the blood libel where they would claim that Jews would slaughter Christian children and drink the blood for their matzah, use the blood for their matzah. Terrible times of history. The blood libel led to the death and the spilling of innocent Jewish blood in many, many different cities over and over and over again. And these two brothers were arrested. They were framed in their printing house was found the dead body of a Christian child. They were arrested. As part of their punishment, they were forced to run a gauntlet. Two rows of soldiers lined up, you know, facing each other. And these two brothers were forced to run with their hands tied behind their backs to walk through the gauntlet of all the soldiers who were beating and hitting them with clubs and sticks and their uh, rifles to walk through the line and to get beaten, etc. And that was part of their punishment. It was a public spectacle. It, was a, it wasn't just a torture. It was part of their public punishment was to be publicly uh, beaten by being called running the gun. That was, that was, there was a legal name for it. <laughs> Can you imagine the barbaric times back then? So the two brothers went, they were lined up, again, the hands tied behind their back. I don't remember the first name, maybe Chaim is my mind, but definitely Shapiro. First brother ran through, and as he ran through, they were beating down on him with their clubs, beating down, raining blows and blows with sticks upon him. The second brother, begins to run through the line also. It's a long line of soldiers on both sides hitting him. And as they're hitting him, his yarmulke fell off. They're beating him. His yarmulke got knocked off his head, punching him. And he stopped. He stopped. He refused to go until he could get his yarmulke back on his head. But his yarmulke, his hands were tied. 
He couldn't bend over and pick up his yamut. And so he stops still in the middle of the gauntlet, and they're beating on him and beating him and beating him, and he refused to continue running until one of the soldiers, can you imagine how beaten he must have been, until one of the soldiers had Gachmanis and put the yamut back on his head so he can finish running the gauntlet. And this is a very public spectacle. It was recorded and became very well known. The heroism of these brothers is actually a song called Nigin Mislavita. I don't know how it starts offhand, unless I was singing tonight. Nigin Mislavita, a Nigin composed by the Slavita brothers while they were in prison, a very haunting, haunting melody. Truly, like you feel the, the pain of innocent holy Jews that were put into prison for no reason other than the fact that they were Jews. You hear the, 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 the depth of the Nisham on that Nigin. I'll, I'll find the very, very powerful Nigin. Anyway, that's the story. And it became very well known in Russia at the time, the Tsarist Russian Slavita, the sacrifice of these Jews for, for, for wearing a yarmulke. Okay, now let me share with you a beautiful perspective on the concept of wearing a yarmulke from a more spiritual perspective. Let's go back one step. Why do we wear clothing in general? Before we get to why we cover our head, Let's first discuss why do we cover the rest of our body? Why do we cover our arms, our body, our stomach, our legs, our, our more private parts of our body? Why do we wear clothing? So I guess the standard scientific or historical perspective, most people would guess or assume that clothing began out of climate, out of shelter, protection. Man needed to protect himself from the elements. And then once man began to wear clothing, um, and once man began to uh, wear clothing, so then they began to, uh, for design, for, for, for looks, began to dress up the clothing and make it more sophisticated and more styled, etc. However, there's a slight issue with this theory, which is that man, because the cradle of humanity, is in Mesopotamia, which is like modern day Iraq, which is a very warm climate. It's not a place in which you have snow or cold where man would need clothing to protect him from the elements. And um, yet we still find that man always wore clothing, including head coverings. You look at any pictures of the olden times, they have head coverings. So where does clothing come from? So of course, if you open up the book of the Bible, if you open up Genesis, you see clearly where clothing comes from. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were frolicking in the garden in their birthday suits. They were very happily, unashamedly naked. And then what happened? Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. They ate from the eighth hadas tov vera, which means they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And what happened after they ate from that tree? They heard the voice of God in the garden, and they were embarrassed, the Torah says. They were ashamed, and they hid. And God comes to Adam and says, where are you? And uh, Ayaka, and he says, I heard your voice. And I was embarrassed and almost in front of me to read the exact words, but these are, I'm paraphrasing, but these are the exact, these are the words of Adam. I heard your voice and I was embarrassed, and so I hid. And God says, are you, were you embarrassed because you ate from the tree, etc., etc. And so basically we see clearly in the Torah that the concept of clothing and covering our body is directly related to the shame of the sin of the tree of knowledge. The Rambam, explains this very well, and in Hasidic literature, this idea has developed a lot, which is, and this, I mean, what I'm going to say now is based on the Rambam, but the Rebbe develops it more. That why were Adam and Eve walking around, frolicking in the garden, perfectly naked and perfectly content being naked? And the answer is because to them, the private parts of their body were no different than their hands. Every organ was created for a divine purpose. Every organ of our body is created for a reason, to do a mitzvah. And just like there's no shame in using your hand to do a mitzvah, to give charity, and just like there's no shame in teaching someone Torah, although when you teach someone Torah, spiritually it's considered like you gave birth to that person. There's no shame in that you're doing a mitzvah. So, so too, the organs of the body that are used for the mitzvah of pru or revu, be fruitful and multiply, are organs that are doing the will of God. 
these organs of the body are being used to fulfill a mitzvah, to have children. So the first mitzvah in the Torah. Even Adam and Eve were already commanded. Maybe they were commanded. Yeah, uh, they were commanded. So Puru they're doing a mitzvah. There's no shame in that. No shame in that. And therefore, Adam and Eve were got walking around the garden perfectly content with no shame because there was no, there was no embarrassment of being intimate with your spouse. You're doing a mitzvah to have children. What happened after they ate from the tree of knowledge? All of a sudden, they had an awareness of tov, vira, of good and bad. Meaning, there was no longer the simplistic, just like a child. A child has no shame to walk around undressed. Why? Because they don't understand the concept of, of temptation. They don't understand the concept of sin. Nor do they have any shame from any of their own temptation or their own sins. So there's actually two dimensions, there's two different parts to the shame of the clothing that the clothing protect, you know, protect us from. One is, there's a shame that comes from knowing how we have sinned, or how we have been tempted, and what thoughts have entered our mind, and what we've thought about in our brains. So there's a shame that comes with that. Just like Adam and Eve had shame, knowing that they had sinned as a result of the intimacy that they had. The reason why the snake was tempted, and it was drawn to Chava, was because he had witnessed Adam and Eve uh, being intimate in the garden with no shame, actually. He got a little excited, and the snake wanted to be part of the party. Um, in addition to the shame that we were reminded of when we see parts of the body, in addition to that, there is a, a temptation, a seduction, a, an arousal that comes from it that embarrasses us. It creates a shame. And therefore, we wear clothing to hide the shame that comes from um, seeing things we shouldn't see. A child doesn't have that temptation. A child can see immodest, uh, uh, immodest just person. They're not aroused. They, they, they have no, they're not reminded of anything negative, and they're not aroused for trying to hide anything negative. So that's why we wear clothing in general. Because now that man sins, and man has become aware of good and evil, meaning now we are aware of temptation, we are aware of sin, we are aware of how an organ that could be used for a mitzvah could also be used for evil. How an organ that can be used for creation of a child can be used for corruption and absolute perversion and disgusting behavior. And it's the same organ. But because we now have that awareness, there's a shame that's associated with it. So therefore, we wear clothing to hide parts of the body that we're ashamed of, which would therefore lead the intellectual amongst us to think that the head which is the most important and exciting and best part of the body, doesn't need to be covered. If anything, why would you want to cover the head? The head is a part of the body that's the, the, brilliance of the, the brilliance of the body. The brilliance of the person is specifically in our brain. So if that's our brilliance, if that's our, uh, you know, our, our, our quality is from the brain, why would we want to, uh, why would we want to hide it? Why would we want to take it away? And so the answer is that, yes, if a person thinks that the greatest part of the body, the greatest part of the person, rather, is his intellect, his head, his brain, and yes, there's no shame in intellect. If you, under, if, if you think that the greatest achievement of man is his intellectual powers, and it's true that our intellectual abilities is what distinguishes us from the animals, animals don't have intellect. They have emotions, they have feelings, they have, you know, sadness and happiness and loyalty. But an, a, an animal can't figure out abstract theoretical ideas the way we can. So you might argue, and in fact, many people in today's society would argue, and they honestly believe, that the greatest achievement of man is his intellectual abilities. However, as Jews, it's very clear to us that our intellect is not our greatest achievement. There is something above. Yare Malka. There is a king above us that we must fear. There is a higher intellectual being, a higher intellectual power that's greater than us, that's more powerful than us. And this greater spiritual power is something that we need to always be very, very in tune and in touch with to make sure that we live 
to make sure that we live in accordance with the will of God. And therefore, because we need to live in accordance with the will of God, we understand that our intellect is not the greatest part of us. In fact, our intellect is almost a sense of shame. Because not only is our intellect, sometimes for many of us, do we not use our intellect to properly study Torah and to properly meditate on the greatness of God and to properly think of ways of helping others and being a holy, righteous, good, productive, kind Jew. Instead, we use our intellect to justify our temptations. We use our intellect to find ways to achieve things that are probably not the right thing that God wants us to do. We use our brain to find ways to make money in ways that we shouldn't make or to find ways to do certain things that we shouldn't do. And instead of using our intellect in a holy way, in a godly way, in a spiritual way, we're using our intellect to fulfill the base temptations of our heart. We're using our intellect to find ways and to rationalize and to excuse and to explain why we behave in certain incorrect, immoral, improper. So if a person is thinking about God, if a person is thinking about the fear of a king above him, you know it gives him the most shame. The part of the body that he's most corrupting, the part of the body that should be devoted solely to the study of Torah, to understanding God, to prayer, to lofty pursuits, that instead of being used to justify and to rationalize and to find ways to fulfill my desires, that's a, that's a source of shame. And in fact, by the way, the greater the person is, the more that they study Torah, the more that they use their brain and their intellect to understand the will and wisdom of God, the more they recognize how far is our intellect from understanding God. The more they understand how far am I from understanding the wisdom of God. And therefore, the more you understand the beautiful line goes, the more you understand, the more you understand how little you understand. The more you use your intellect, the more you realize how embarrassed I am, how, how, how inferior I feel in comparison to the true wisdom of God. And so if a person doesn't feel that the intellect is a source of shame, you know what it probably means? <laughs> that his intellect hasn't been used that much in the study of God, in the service of God. Because the more that you use your intellect to try to understand God, and to connect to God, the more you realize the shame of how far and how distant we are. So two things. A, the shame of what we've done wrong with our brains, how we've used our brains in unholy ways. And number two, recognizing the temptation, or in this case, the lack of fulfillment and the awareness of how much more holy and godly we could be if we would only do it properly. So that is a spiritual perspective and a spiritual significance to the wearing of the kippah, that we should feel the shame of our head to recognize how much greater and more we need to uh, learn. Good evening to all of you that are watching, Terry and to Jeff, to Yitzchak, to Noah and to Mike. How are you, Mike? How are you, Luis? And uh, anyone else that's watching, good evening. That is the story, why we wear a kippah. I'll say one more thing and say why we wear a hat. So because when you go to pray, you need to wear, I got a comment here, wearing a hat that when we go to pray just like at the times of the temple they will put on the kippah to sign of respect for prayer so today there's a concept of modern jewish law that we should never when we go to pray we put on the second covering so there's still a unique second covering in order to fulfill the idea of putting on a second covering before we go to pray i should also say i should have said this earlier i forgot the taz since i'm talking about jewish law the taz the Turi Zahar, which is one of the commentaries on the Code of Jewish Law says, regarding wearing a kippah, that since today, wearing a kippah also became a sign of the differentiation and distinction between a Jew and a non-Jew. I should have said this before, but we'll say it now, Baruch Hashem. The distinction between a Jew and a non-Jew is very much expressed in the wearing of a kippah. Wearing a kippah is a tremendous sign of Jewish pride. I'm a Jew and I'm proud and I'll wear it on my head. So that's a kippah. So when a Jew, so the Taz writes, that because wearing a kippah has now become the symbol of Jewish pride, almost like wearing a high necklace almost, if a person does not wear a yarmulke, a kippah, he is pro, he's fulfilling the negative commandments, transgressing rather, 
he is sinning by transgressing the negative commandment of not going in the ways of the non-Jews. There is a prohibition in the Torah not to dress like the non-Jews, not to behave like the non-Jews. And by wearing a kippah, that's how we distinguish ourselves. And we show that we are God's special chosen nation. We are God's, uh, we're God's people. And if a person does not wear the kippah, says the Taz, he is removing that distinction between us and the other nations of the universe, and therefore he's committing the transgression of going in the ways of the non-Jews. But for us, it's not only about that, it's about a sign of a connection to God, more importantly, an awareness of the fact that God is always over us, and God is always watching us, and God always sees us, and God is in command, God is in control. The whole world is full of His glory. And so that will end with the story. One of my favorite stories, I've said it many times, it's a beautiful story. It's a kid's story. It's a kid's uh, video. I saw this video when I was a kid, and it's ingrained in my head forever and ever. There was once a man who was traveling on a wagon. A rabbi. I don't know who the rabbi was. Shpaler Zayda, maybe a rabbi. He was traveling on a wagon with a wagon driver, and the wagon driver was hungry. And all of a sudden... As he's hungry, he passed by a beautiful orchard of trees, beautiful orchard of apple trees. And the wagon driver sees all these beautiful apples ripe, ready to be picked, hanging over the, you know, right over there, right over the other side of the fence. So the wagon driver tells the rabbit, you know what? Wait one second, you be the watchman for me. I'm really, really hungry. I just forgot to pack myself lunch. Just watch the, uh, you be the watchman, watch the road, make sure nobody's coming. I'm gonna quickly climb over the fence. I'll grab myself uh, two apples. And uh, I will be on our way. Okay, Rabbi agrees. The man puts down the whole, you know, puts on the reins. Quickly jumps over the fence, starts to climb the apple tree to pick two apples. And just as he's about to reach the branch where the apples are on, the rabbi begins to scream, "Somebody's watching! Somebody's watching! Quick!" The, the wagon driver jumps off the branch, jumps over the fence, jumps into the wagon, whipping the horses, whipping them, flying. And as they're escaping from the scene, he looks over. <laughs> There's nobody there. Looks over his other shoulder. Nobody's watching. So he says, Rabbi, well, he tricked me. There's nobody watching. And I missed the apples. So the rabbi says, somebody was watching. Hashem. Hashem was watching. Yamukah. Hashem is watching. Good night, my friends.